Today we're going to return to our sermon series on the life of Peter. And we've been talking about how he has indeed been touched by the master's hand. We took a couple of weeks off. We talked about Palm Sunday two weeks ago. And of course last week we looked at some evidence of the fact that we can know for sure that Jesus rose from the grave as we celebrated Resurrection Sunday last week. I want to look today at another teaching moment from Jesus, and it's found in John chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to be, John chapter 6 today. Now, let me introduce the message in this way. How many of you have ever heard of the word pluralism? Kind of a fancy word, pluralism. It's been said that we live in a pluralistic society. Well, that word has many meanings, but one meaning has to do with the many different choices that we can make on a daily basis. Now, I'm just going to give you this as an example. If you have a television set at home, I don't know what you use. If you have cable television or you use one of the many options now, regardless of what you have, you can ha get up to two to three to four hundred different channels on your television set, right? I mean, there's just all kinds of choices for you to watch on television. In much the same way, when it comes to religion or it comes to our faith, people have a lot of options. There are literally hundreds of different Christian churches, at least those who claim that they teach Christianity. And then along with that, there's all these other religions in the world other than Christianity. We live in a land, we live in an era where we have many options. And that's one of the meanings for pluralism. But there's another meaning. Pluralism also promotes the idea that truth is subjective. Now here's what I mean by that. Subjective truth means if I go into an ice cream parlor, and I want you to know I love ice cream. And Deborah and I are looking forward in a couple weeks. We're going to be at Kirk's in Myrtle Beach. And I love their ice cream down there. So when you go into a, an ice cream parlor, Let's say they may have 30, 30, some, I think Baskin Robbins says they have 31 different flavors. So when you go in there, you can pick whatever flavor that you want. So if I go to an ice cream shop, most of the time if I get an ice cream cone, I'm going to get strawberry because it is, after all, the best. I mean, I get strawberry ice cream. Now, maybe you not knowing just how good strawberry ice cream is, you decide to choose plain old vanilla. Well, each of us is free to pick whatever we like. That's pluralism. Not only can we choose the flavor we like, we can mix and match. We can come up with our own concoction. And all that is fine with ice cream. But sadly, that's the same thing that too many people try to do with religion and faith. They, they do a pluralistic viewpoint. So people may say, well, you know, I like this about Christianity, and I, I like this about Buddhism, and, and I like this about humanism, and I'm going to sprinkle in a little bit of dab of scripture, and I'm going to come up with my own concoction that's just for me when it comes to my faith. And after all, it's really what I want, and what I want doesn't necessarily mean that's what you want. You can do your thing with your faith, and I can do my thing with my faith, and we're all okay. It's right for everybody. Well, that's not true. And yet that's the error in which we live today. We live with people believing in this pluralistic society, especially when it comes to faith issues. Now, with that in mind, I want you to consider a blog that I read. <laughs> I thought this was pretty good. A guy by the name of Kevin DeYoung has a blog called Restless and Reformed. Now, I don't usually read this, but I read this a long time ago. I put it in my notes. I want to read it today. In this particular blog, he describes how people try to fit Jesus into their own ideas, their own desires. So to begin the blog, and this is just a portion of it, this is what he writes. There's the Republican Jesus who is against tax increases and activist judges. He's for family values and owning firearms. There's Democrat Jesus who's against Wall Street and Walmart and is for reducing our carbon footprint and printing money. There's therapist Jesus 
who helps us cope with life's problems, heals our past, tells us how valuable we are, and not to be so hard on ourselves. There's open-minded Jesus who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for people who are not as open-minded as you. There's touchdown Jesus who helps athletes run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcomes of Super Bowls. There's martyr Jesus, a good man who died a cruel death so we can feel sorry for him. There's gentle Jesus who is meek and mild with high cheekbones, flowing hair, and walks around barefoot. There's gentle Jesus who is meek and mild. There's hippie Jesus who teaches everyone to give peace a chance, imagines a world without religion, and helps us remember that all you need is love. There's revolutionary Jesus who teaches us to rebel against the status quo. After all, all our problems are a result of the system. Then there's guru Jesus a wise, inspirational teacher who believes in you and helps you find your center. And then there's good example Jesus who shows you how to help people change the planet and become a better you. Now, that's just a few examples that he put in his blog, but I really like how he concluded this blog. He said this, Then there's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, Not just another prophet, not just another rabbi, not just another wonder worker. He is the son of David, Abraham's chosen seed, the one to heal the sick, to give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. He is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. He is our Lord and God, the Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins, more loving, more holy, and more wonderful than we ever thought possible. I liked that ending for who Jesus really is. Now, I said all that to say this. In our story from the life of Peter that I want us to look at today, we will witness Jesus taking a stand for who he really is. As Jesus refuses to allow the world to push him into its mold, we will see the reaction of both the crowds and Peter himself. Most of the crowd was ready to leave Jesus, as we're going to see. But I really love the response that Peter gave, and we're going to get to that at the end of the message. But here's what I want. May we all learn today that as the title of the message proclaims, there is nowhere else to go. Only Jesus saves. Before we continue, as we always do, We need to ask God for his blessing, his wisdom, his understanding, his help as we open a portion of his word today from John chapter 6. Let's ask for that help right now. Good morning again, Father, and we thank you that it's now our time to open your word for a few moments. We praise you that we have your word, that you have secured it for us down through the ages. And we're going to have it with us until Jesus returns. Thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that you will use me in a way that will be pleasing to you today as we talk about this passage from John 6, where Jesus is starting to reveal truths that a lot of people didn't like. And I know today, Father, there are still people who do not like some of the truths that your word teaches to us about Jesus and what, who he is and what he has done. So Lord, I pray, give us wisdom, give us understanding, and help us to learn and grow today that we too might leave here knowing there is nowhere else to go, only Jesus saves. Help us to learn that truth today, Father. So bless us is my prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to start with the background of the story here. Jesus had just fed the multitude, 5,000 men including women and children, with five loaves and two fish. And so in verse 15 of John 6, John writes this. So Jesus, aware that they intended to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. See, the crowd that day after Jesus had performed this miracle believed he could be a great king for them. He could bring them bread, much like Moses did in the Old Testament, 
And all Jesus had to do was to speak the word and the bread would come from literally nowhere out of thin air. And so the crowd was saying to themselves, this is the kind of man we want to rule over us. That's why they were going to take him by force. There were people there who loved Jesus because we like these miracles that he's doing. But then Jesus would say something that would turn people off. And that's what he did here in John chapter 6. Now I want to look first of the fact that Jesus said to the crowd in John 6 verse 48, I am the bread of life. And then he goes on to explain what he means by that beginning in verse 51. So let's read that. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I will give for the life of the world also is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So they were taking this literally. They're thinking, wait a minute, Jesus is talking about cannibalism here. So he continues. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Now, it sounds odd that Jesus would teach like this. So let me preface everything I'm about to say today by this background again. In the Middle Eastern countries of New Testament times, bread was the most important part of the meal. Now, in our culture today, whenever we go to a restaurant, we generally focus on what kind of entree we're going to order. And the basket of bread that comes on the table in some places is usually secondary. Except when you go to Texas Roadhouse and I can feast on the bread. Right? Or you go to Olive Garden. I love the breadsticks at Olive Garden. Okay? But in that day, meat was simply a side dish. Bread represented the major part of the meal. So Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. So what did he mean by this? And then he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Now, if they would have thought about it, they would have recognized Jesus was talking figuratively. Now, I know there are some people today who still believe that when we come around the communion table, that that actually becomes the actual flesh and blood of Jesus. But we know Jesus was not talking literally here because the Old Testament for, has forbidden the eating and drinking of blood. So listen to what Jesus says as he continues in verses 56 and 7. doesn't get a whole lot clearer yet, he says. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. The one who eats me, he also will live because of me. Now, here's the advantage for us today. Those of us today who live on this side of the cross can see the application that can be made here to the Lord's Supper. Now, we know later, a little over a year later, Jesus would institute what we describe today as the Lord's Supper or communion. And I want to read Matthew's version, and you can see the symbolism here. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26. Matthew writes, Now while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. So each Sunday, as we gather around the Lord's table, we are once again reminded that the loaf and the cup represent that sacrifice that Jesus made for us his body, and his blood. So I believe this teaching in John 6 definitely has a reference to that. I think it goes even beyond that than just the Lord's Supper alone because it would be another year before Jesus would give this teaching to his disciples. So the question is, 
What is the spiritual significance to Jesus' symbolism concerning his flesh and blood? Well, as far as his flesh was concerned, Jesus was the spiritual food that brought everlasting life to everyone who would partake. Jesus was not actual bread any more than he was an actual door, which he said in John chapter 10, verse 7. Figuratively, he was bread. Figuratively, we partake of his flesh. He gave himself in death. We give ourselves in faith and obedience to him. Only then can this true bread, he said, I am the bread of life, bring us true life. So the symbolism here was very similar to the symbolism he gave to the woman at the well back in John 4. Just previous to this, the woman at the well came to draw water from the well. Jesus began speaking to her. She couldn't believe it because Jews didn't speak with Samaritans, let alone women. And so this is what he said to her in John 4, verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty, but the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. He's using symbolism there, just as he was in John chapter 6. So here in 6, Jesus says he's the bread of life. What he was saying is he's the most important part of life, just as bread was the most important part of the meal. He is the one who makes us righteous. He is the one who sustains our relationship with God, just as bread nourishes the physical body. So I hope you can see how important it is to partake of the bread which comes down out of heaven, and of course that's Jesus. But Jesus is going to help us with this because the second point, we're going to look at Jesus' application to what he was saying. And the application is found at the end of verse 63. Here's what Jesus said. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Now he makes this application because of what we read in verse 60. So after he was talking about what I just read, verses 51 through 57, verse 60 says, So then many of his disciples, when they heard this, what Jesus was saying, this statement is very unpleasant. Who can listen to it? So when the crowd said in verse 60 that this statement was unpleasant to them, it did not mean hard to understand. It meant hard to accept. In other words, it was offensive to them. The crowd was murmuring. The crowd was protesting because they did understand the implication of Jesus' words at least to a certain degree. They understood him to be saying that he was the Messiah. His kingdom was one of the spirit of self-surrender and obedience to God's word. They didn't want to follow that. They wanted to follow all the miracles that he was performing. Man, I don't even have to work anymore. Jesus will provide the bread for me to live on. That's what they wanted. That's why they were following Jesus. Today, many people either refuse to walk with Jesus or they stop walking with Jesus, not because they're puzzled, not because they do not understand, but because Jesus challenges our lives and he challenges about what the cost of being his disciple is going to be. Now, here's another point that I think is a good one to make, especially in this believe-what-you-want-to-believe world that we live in. When the people complained about what Jesus was preaching, what did Jesus do? Did he back off of his preaching? Did he try to make it more acceptable to the people who were starting to leave him? No. Jesus was on the verge of losing many of the people who were following him, but he did not change his message. And I believe there's a lesson in that for us today. Now, listen, we're not to go out and intentionally offend people. The way that we share our faith, the way that we preach, the way that we teach has to be done with love. But I want you to understand that the message of truth, no matter how lovely you put it, no matter how you express it, no matter how I preach it or teach it or others, it's still going to offend some people. 
However, we are never to change the message in order to make people happy. There are many people today who do not like the fact that as Christians we teach that Jesus is the only way to God. But that's the truth Jesus did communicate and is still communicating to us through his word. He is the only way to God. Now I want you to notice what he says in verses 61 and 62. But Jesus, aware that his disciples were complaining about this, said to them, Is this offensive to you? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? So here's what Jesus is saying. If what I just said caused you to stumble, what are you going to do when you see me ascend back into heaven? And I'm guessing there were probably many present on that day who would see that miraculous event described for us in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus did indeed go back to heaven. And so verse 63 is the key to understanding the application that Jesus makes to this teaching in John chapter 6. Now, I read the last part of the verse earlier. Let me read the entire verse, verse 63. Jesus said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh provides no benefit. It's not about the physical bread. It's not about these miracles that I'm giving to you. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit in our life. So it's not the miracles. It's the words I speak, Jesus said, that's going to bring you eternal life. So when Jesus speaks of life, he speaks of eternal life. Without Jesus, we will be eternally separated from God. Without Jesus, we will not go to heaven. Now, for many people today, the concept of heaven is something that's far in the distant future. But let me ask you this. Isn't life more than just living and dying? Isn't there more to life than making money, working, and accumulating stuff? Where is the hope in this life? Jesus says, the hope is in me. Our hope is in Jesus. And if we belong to him... The Bible assures us that we possess eternal life and we can know right now, right today, that we have eternal life and we're going to heaven. We can know that without any doubt. Now I want to get to the last section of this sermon and the last section of this teaching in John chapter 6 because this is what's really exciting to me. So the last main point I am calling the challenge Jesus gives and it's found in verse 67. Jesus asked his 12 apostles this question. You do not want to leave also, do you? That was a challenge. Why did he ask that question? Why did Jesus challenge them and us today with that question? Well, we need to go back to verse 66, which says, as a result of this, meaning as a result of what Jesus has just taught, Many of his disciples left and would no longer walk with him. They not only gave up following Jesus, they also gave up everything that he represented, everything that he taught. They followed him as long as he was going to bring bread physically on their tables. But at that first teaching concerning moral and spiritual food, the cross and self-surrender on their part, they turned their backs on Jesus. The Bible says many left Jesus because they didn't count the cost of discipleship. So Jesus sees all these multitudes who are leaving. So now he addresses the 12. He looks at these hand-picked men that he had chosen to carry on the work after he went back into heaven. And he asks them this question. You do not want to leave also, do you? Now, when some people read that question, they read into the verse something that I don't read into this verse. They read into this verse a note of fear, a note of hurt, like, oh, you guys aren't going to leave me also, are you? Oh, I'm going to be so hurt. I don't think that's the key here at all. That's not what Jesus is teaching. That's not my view. Jesus was offering them the same option that the crowd had already taken. 
You can walk away from me if you want to. Because you see, God has given every single one of us the gift of choice. That is the nature of love. Love does not coerce. Love does not demand. Love does not insist. God allows us to make choices every day, including the choice of walking away and rejecting his love. And if we do walk away, God doesn't chase after us saying, I'm sorry, please don't walk away from me. I'll change my commands according to your desires. Just please don't leave me. Jesus doesn't do that. God will let us leave, but that doesn't mean he's going to give up on us. So if you're here today or you're watching online and you're not living for Jesus and you know you need to get back with him, If you have walked away with God, I want to remind you that he's going to continue to pursue you. He's going to be ever calling for you to return to him. And when you do, he's going to receive you with open and welcome arms. That's the God that we serve. And I praise him for that. Thankfully, Peter understood what the crowds had missed. He spoke for the group. In verses 68 and 69, and this I love this. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. And we have already believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Praise God, Peter got it right again. Even though the going was tough at the moment, Following Jesus was not going to get any easier and was not going to make him popular, yet Peter knew Jesus was worth following. So we're going to give Peter an A plus on that one. He got it right. He had come to believe and to know that Jesus was the real deal. He did not want to walk away from him. Where else would he and the other apostles turn? If not Jesus, who would they go to? You see, we can try every other religion out there other than Jesus, but every other religion is false because it does not share God's truth about Jesus. So it's not like going to the ice cream parlor and selecting the one that means the most to you. It's not the same. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes from the Father except through me. He was excluding all others who teach that they are the way to God. So as Peter and the others watched and listened to Jesus, they were developing a deep conviction about who he really was. The apostles weren't there for fish sandwiches. They weren't there to start a Jewish revolt against Rome. They weren't there just to find a new list of rules. They weren't there to hold a big miracle crusade. They were there because they believed and knew that Jesus was the Holy One of God, the Messiah, the bread of life. Peter and the other apostles knew they had nowhere else to turn, that only Jesus saves. And that's what I want you to know as you leave here today. Now, I realize they didn't fully comprehend all there was to know about Jesus until after the resurrection, but they knew enough to know that Jesus had the word of life in him. Up until this point, the ride had been pretty easy for them, but now it was going to start getting tougher. So my question today is, what about you? Do you know that only Jesus saves? I want to end with this following true story. This was just... I don't know, it was very challenging to me when I read this, and I think it's a great story. A man by the name of Marshall decided he was going to start a church in this mountain village in the country of Mexico. It was a village of mostly Indians, and many of them either spoke a little bit of Spanish or no Spanish at all. Spanish, of course, is the language of the Mexicans. So Marshall purchased a hand-cranked record player that he would bring, he would sit in the middle of the town square, and he would play recordings of native speakers reading portions of the New Testament. And so then people would kind of gather around, they were listening to what he was playing, 
And so then he would attempt to strike up a conversation with them in broken Spanish with those who had gathered to see what was going on. And in time, there were some people who began to follow Jesus. And so he had this very, very small church. But people in the village didn't like what Marshall was doing. Some of them were gathering together, and they started beating Marshall and the people that were gathering around with stones. Other people went to the, some of these believers' homes, and they began to rage against them. One believer was actually tied to a tree and hacked to death with machetes. Now, can you imagine what it must have been like to live as a Christian in that village? Well, after several months, the very small but growing congregation decided they were going to build a church building at the edge of town. Marshall had told others they were not going to put a baptistry in that building. When asked why, he explained, there was only one place nearby with enough water to baptize people, and that was a river that flowed near the edge of the village on the other side of the village. And the only way to reach the river was to walk through town right past this large cathedral that was located very close to the village square. So as the candidates for baptism would walk to the river, they had to go by this cathedral. And crowds would gather to jeer them. And they would pelt them with rocks and rotten vegetables, all under the approving gaze of the local priests of that cathedral. Because of the opposition, Marshall stated that only those willing to make a break with the past would follow the Savior in baptism. You see, those believers believed that that's what they needed to do. They were serious about their faith. They were committed to being baptized into Christ regardless of what they had to face in order to get to the river. I like that story because it took commitment for those people to give their lives to Jesus. My question as the praise team comes today is this. Are you going to stick with Jesus when you start to see some of what he teaches is not going to make you popular? Will you sacrifice your faith for popularity? As we do every Sunday, this is your moment of truth. What will you do with Jesus? Now, many of you have already made that commitment to follow him. Praise God for that. But there may be some here today who have not. So let me end with this. If you would have been there with Jesus when he preached his sermon that we found in John chapter 6, would you have walked away as the majority of the crowd did? Or would you have echoed Peter's words? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life, and we have already believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God.